Judge Judy Scheinlin is the presiding judge on Judge Judy and author of What Would Judy Say? A Grown-Up Guide to Living Together with Benefits. Oh my God, she's here. She's here. If I'm dreaming, don't pinch me. Thank you so much for being here. It's a joy for me. This is such a joy a for me. Such and a lots thrill. of congratulations. Thank you very much. The number one television show in America. Yeah. Highest paid, hugely successful, and there's a reason for that. And it's not just your TV presence, which is so compelling. It's your personal philosophies, which we get to hear uh, from you on the air. And this is something you have been railing about since you wrote the book that is actually my Dianetics. <laughs> Don't pee on my leg and tell me it's raining, which was back in 1996. You talk a lot in this book and ever since about personal responsibility and about not accepting mediocrity as the norm. Your thoughts? Oh my goodness. How much time do we have? We have a lot of time. Take, let's take start, all the time you need. Let's start with uh, the fact that this month, no, November actually, November 19th, is the 150th anniversary of when Lincoln delivered the Gettysburg Address. Mm -hmm. And you know, we all learned in school about the Gettysburg Address, what it stood for and, and what it said. And at that point, uh, the president was commemorating a, a cemetery for the fallen Union soldiers at, at Gettysburg. Uh, the last line of it, if I remember it correctly, is that it, uh, if we shouldn't forget that this is a nation of the people, by the people, and for the people. So let's start with that. If it's a government of the people and by the people, we're talking about people who are responsible, have to act responsibly. And we're also talking about the fact that government is there to serve us, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go back to a story, Megan. When I was the supervising judge in family court in Manhattan back in the 80s, I had a judge who didn't take the bench on time. I like to get there early, people are waiting, citizens pay for an expensive court system, just like the public pays for an expensive government. Mm -hmm. And I felt as if I was a public servant. They paid my salary, they were entitled to a day's work for a day's pay. So court started at 9.15, I was on the bench at 9 o'clock, ready to get going, and everybody else was there waiting for me, court officers, clerks. This judge had a house in the Hamptons. And he couldn't get to work on time on Monday before 11. And I would say to him, Judge, it's not the right thing. You have people sitting outside. He said, they can't do anything unless I'm here. And I said, but you know, you're a public servant. This public is not there to serve your needs. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a lot of what we're seeing in government today. Mm -hmm. We're seeing mediocre people elected to substantial positions because very, very often substantial people don't want to run for government office anymore because of all the hassles of it. And we have mediocre people taking positions where they can affect the lives of 300 million people. I mean, whether you believe in Obamacare or don't. That's the law right now. So let's get moving, folks. Whatever your position is on it, that's what the public voted for at a particular time in our history. So that's what we have now, and we have to work, we have to work around that. That being said, I think that the government today is too big. And the government has forgotten its vision that it is there to serve the public. Mm -hmm. And what about that? Because you write in, your, in this book, which I love so much, Don't Pee on My Leg and Tell Me It's Raining, you talk about how by shifting the emphasis from individual responsibility to government responsibility, we have infantilized an entire population. We expect too much from our government. Absolutely right. I think that 150 years ago, when, uh, when Abe Lincoln delivered the Gettysburg Address, everybody served in the army. Big ones, tall ones, strong ones, not so strong ones. If you had an ear infection, you still served. If you could only see out of one eye, you still served. You did what you had to do in order to take that responsibility to the next level. Well, I think that if you have children, you have to do whatever it takes to support them. That's your job. I made children. I supported the children and brought them up, the ones that I made. I actually don't want to support your children. Right. 
I don't. You have three children. You have three children because you know it's expensive to raise children. It's expensive. I'm mean, sure it's very nice. You pop, you can pop out a baby every year. You know, you then, <laughs> I, I have been. And, and then and then have a television program. You know, <laughs> named in your honor. But actually, if you're responsibly parenting, you only have the number of children that you can afford to take care of. And when the government, in effect, says to you, you know what? You have them. We'll take care of them. Yeah. And when the government says in my view, and I know that this is going to sound harsh, and I'm going to get lots of mail. Don't send me negative mail. I don't read it. I'm too old. <laughs> if you are a drug addict or an alcoholic, I actually don't think that that's the kind of disability that should be subsidized by the American public who work hard for their money, those people who are working. If you choose drugs and choose alcohol, you may. Let your family take care of you. But when I have cases, and I've had them for 30 years, of people who are receiving disability because they are either drug addicts, alcoholics, some have bad backs, some suffer from, you know, I have carpal tunnel in my hand, I have uh, lupus, I, well, I have a daughter-in-law who has lupus. Yeah, sometimes she's tired, but most of the time she gets up and does what she has to do. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's debilitating, sometimes not. But I think what we've done to a whole group of people is say, not to worry. We'll t if you can't take care of yourself, we'll take care of you. We'll do it for you. I have a, a man, when I have a man, a perfectly capable, able-bodied guy who has been going to college for seven years and getting $20,000 a year from the government, and the only thing he can do after seven years is play the guitar, I think somebody's got their hand in my pocket. To steal a line from Tommy Boy, lots of people go to college for seven years. Yeah, they're called doctors. <laughs> <laughs> right, All good. Right, well, I like that because I want to talk to you about mediocrity and how you're, you're upset about the fact that now everybody's a winner. Everybody's a winner. There's no second place anymore. Everybody gets a blue ribbon. Everybody's a valedictorian. Uh, and we're going to pick up with Judge Judy there. And by the way, Judge